Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. We're so excited to have you at our third session in our many multi-part series looking at digital transformation in higher education. This particular session is all things partnerships. We're looking at university partnerships with OPMs, MOOC camps, sorry, MOOCs <laughs> and MOOC camps and everything in between and just really can't wait to get stuck in. Um, we have a massively diverse list of registrants for this session, which really speaks to the complexities and kind of dynamic interests that are all operating within the space. And it's just, we're really excited to hear from all of you. And to lead us through this session, I have the great fortune of being joined by two really, really, really exceptional minds in this space. Uh, Lucy Blakemore leads our digital capability work here at Hall and IQ. Hey, Lucy. Hi, Lila. And Patrick Brothers, one of our co-CEOs, our boss. Great to see you. Hi. Hi, everybody. Amazing. And I'm Beth Hogan. I'm the VP of Customer Experience here and just really excited to hear what we've got today. A lot of you are probably familiar with us. I know we have a lot of our clients on the call, which is really great to see. Um, for anyone who's less familiar, Holland IQ is the world's trusted source when it comes to the new education economy. We're used by leading journalists all over the world to really help shape dialogue and look at where this space is going. We're also used by an incredible group of customers ranging from anywhere between technology, government, academia, investment, and again, all things in between. Um, we're really, really, yep, yeah. <laughs> and um, we're helping them drive strategy, build out and optimize for the greatest impact, and um, it's really great to see, again, many of them on the call. So we got a lot to get through. I'm going to jump right in. Just like all of the previous sessions and the many to come, these are action-packed, super, super dynamic 45-minute sessions. The part of the series we're in right now is really the part one deep dives. We're really looking at, to, at many different thematics across the space and really getting into them deep into the weeds to understand them better. The second part of the series will be Q2. I'm sorry, Q2. We're going to be looking at case studies of technologies and platforms that are really helping drive this space. And then Q3, we're going to look at some case studies by universities as they're thinking about how to adapt to this normal, I won't say new normal, um, and everything coming up. Oh, and a few things about these sessions. We get asked all the time about is, is this going to be recorded? Yes, it's recorded. You're going to get the recording in your inbox after the session completes. We're also really excited to have the chat function included. So we love seeing the conversation in the chat and definitely jump in and say where you're from and you know say, say hi if you know anybody. We're also going to be running a number of polls throughout the session to start picking your brains and getting your perspectives. And we're also taking questions. We'll do our very best to answer them as much as we can, um, but definitely do throw those in. So lots of ways to engage. OK, so I'm going to kick us off with our first poll. For anyone who's not familiar or this is their first time here, just head over to the poll button on the right side of the chat. Okay, first question to kick us off. Where do you see the most interest slash strongest growth in public-private partnerships in higher education? One, campus facilities infrastructure. Two, online program expansion. Three, skills training and boot camps or international education, and five, current assets leveraging, e.g., uh, energy and parking. Just, I'm just jumping in, Beth. So we've got 800 registrants for this webinar. Please jump in and contribute so that all of your peers get to see uh, what this collective mindset's view is. Yes, definitely. Always really great to see that um, jumping in. Right now, we're seeing it's looking like a little bit of a deadlock between skills training, boot camps, and online program expansion. We're seeing a little bit in the international education and campus facility space. Nobody yet saying leveraging current assets. Oh, it's always really fun when it's head-to-head -head like this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, maybe we'll give it another couple seconds. Wow, it really is a, a lock-in between skills training. Oh, online program expansion just took the lead. Yeah, I think it's gonna hold it too. Well, All right. Here we go. Sorry, Beth. <laughs> Super fascinating. 
Great, okay, I'm just gonna take us through the agenda and then kick us off. Um, we're gonna start off with Lucy walking us through the digital capability framework. She's gonna help us lay the groundwork and use that as um, understand kind of all the components of that. Then Patrick's gonna take us through strategic considerations and models as well as size and segmentation. And then we're gonna close out with some scenarios. Um, all right, take it away. Thank you, Beth. Okay, so before Pat hits us with the data and the detail, um, we're going to come back out to the learner life cycle, which is hopefully the reason we're all doing this. Um, this is our higher education digital capability framework. Um, it's something that is really underpinning a lot of our thinking, if not all of our thinking on higher education as we go broad and deep this year. Um, and with this massive focus on digital transformation, having a framework where you can see the big pieces but also go down into the detail is just becoming so so useful you can stay at the top and you can look across or you can dive right in um, down into learning design or learner experience and just start to pick apart what are the things that you want to be talking about at this point with your institution um, so quick tour because patrick's going to refer to this um, framework so just to set it in your heads there are four stages that it focuses on from demand and discovery, which includes things like the, all of the strategy work, market insights, customer understanding, student recruitment and enrollment and marketing, through to learning design, which includes the full gamut from curriculum design through digital content and courseware, the subject matter expertise that goes into that course design, teaching strategies that need to be considered as you're designing, and then through into the virtual or physical campus space, as I think of it, into learner experience where you're looking into academic administration, the portals and the synchronous and asynchronous learning um, environments that students are um, experiencing learning in, student life, everything from clubs to onboarding to well-being, and then assessment and verification. And then on the right-hand side, the work and lifelong learning stage of the learner life cycle. So, um, of course, this crosses back into learner experience with things like um, internships and work simulation, um, but also leads into career planning and placement, industry and business engagement, and alumni and continuing education. So keep those themes in mind, left to right, but also um, the other way to read this is top to bottom. So you've got the, the looking across very broadly at the top, and then you can break down into more and more detail, depending on whether you're laser focusing on one of those areas or if you need to stay strategically focused across the whole lot. Um, frameworks are lovely. Doing stuff with them is even lovelier. Um, and this one has lots of different ways that you can engage with it and, and do stuff with it. So um, we've talked a little bit in previous sessions about self-assessments, whether it's just going through yourself, there's an individual self-assessment that you can do when you join the higher ed network with us. Um, and you can just go through and just pose the questions, where are the strengths, the gaps, where's the impact um, for digital capability for my institution, but also doing that institutionally. Um, and we've got some really, really interesting things starting to come out of those institutional self-assessments. But for today, think more about the right-hand side of this slide. So ultimately, I mean, where these conversations often start are with the strategic decisions and digital choices that somebody needs to make. Somebody said, make a decision about that. And so the, that decision ideally starts back in a framework so you know why it's being made um, and, and where to loop back to when things work or don't work. So Pat's going to dive into a lot of this in a lot more detail, particularly aspects like buy, build and partner at that strategic level. This is always my favorite part. So we try and challenge this framework. Frameworks are great for breaking. So each time we look at a new theme for higher education, we figure out um, whether the framework works with it. And so in, in this case, we try to gray out the boxes where the topic is less relevant and leave the ones in color where um, it's really got a part to play. And you can see just, just even focusing out and running your eyes across where the colors are that partnerships are everywhere. They're, they're all the way across the cycle from demand and discovery through to work and lifelong learning and they're at the top and they're down deep. Um, I think the thing that we need to be aware of is that those partnerships, sometimes they do go across the whole life cycle, but sometimes they're just in one of those verticals um, as a specialist partner. Again, Pat's going to cover all of that in lots of detail. Um, and then you might notice perhaps there's a little clustering of blue and green in the middle a bit more there because traditionally um, some of that earlier OPM type work has been in that learning design and learner experience space. 
Um, so many interesting examples coming out also in the demand and discovery, student recruitment, um, market demand space, but also in the work and lifelong learning with things like short courses, linking up with industry skills, um, lots of super interesting partnerships between university and industry happening there. All right, I'm going to finish with a poll after that quick tour. Um, and so your second poll for today um, tests whether you've been listening to the stages of the life cycle um, and asks, for which part of the life cycle do you see the greatest benefit from public-private partnerships? And I'm going to ask, once you've put your answer in, if you wouldn't mind telling us why in the chat area as well. Awesome. Hey, while everyone's filling that out, um, as you can see, Lucy's been super busy with the framework. All of that is available at digitalcapability.org. That framework is an open source framework led by Lucy, led by Holland IQ, but it, it's open source. So digitalcapability.org, um, write that down, visit there afterwards. We'll throw it in the chat um, as well. That's where you can download that beautiful rainbow of capabilities and uh, inspect it in your own time. Whilst you've been talking, Pat, it's really, really interesting leading by far is work and lifelong learning um, at the moment on about 54 percent of responses um, so people in this conversation are saying that work and lifelong learning has the most to gain from pro public private partnerships at the moment um, quite a way behind still sitting around 20 percent is demand and discovery so it could be marketing processes could be um, finding new models could be recruitment enrollment um, and then learner experience sitting about 12% and learning design at about 8%, which I don't, this to me says that maybe we've kind of done a lot of the partnerships work in those traditional spaces in learning design and learner experience. And, and maybe that'll still continue, but a really interesting area. People seem to be keen to get into the orange bit of the cycle on the right hand side and just um, really see how that's going to benefit. That was my interpretation anyway. I'm going to hop into the chat and see what people have been saying about their choices now. Awesome. All right, I might I might kick off then. Um, look, before I start this session, there's going to be you're going to be hit with a whole lot of data. As Beth mentioned, um, you will receive the recording straight after. I just want to underscore this is a grown up conversation. This is not an emotionally driven conversation. This is one that's empathetic to the challenges and the opportunities that universities have around the world. And this one that recognizes and again is empathetic to um, just how magnificent and how broad the capabilities of private partners as well. So we're gonna talk a lot about partnerships, which is a grown up conversation. We're gonna frame that up um, as well. Before we kick off, because we love to get you involved, I've got, I've got a poll as well. I just wanna get this out of you before we dive into all of the data. And the question here, let me just publish it, is from your perspective, whether you are at a university, you're at an OPM or a MOOC or a boot camp, or you are involved somehow, what are the top reasons higher education institutions would partner with a private company? And now we're starting to hit on areas of, of capability. And so as I'm watching these come in, speed to market has sped ahead. <clears throat> Unique competencies is accelerating as well. Superior service to in-house alternatives is up there as well. It's interesting availability of investment capital is down the bottom. Perhaps that's a little more related to infrastructure partnerships than what we're talking about today, academic public-private partnerships. Circling back again, please contribute to these polls. We've got hundreds of hundreds of you here with us. Speed to markets well ahead. Unique competencies is catching up. Superior service to in-house alternatives is very strong as well. Okay, so I woke a few people up. Availability of investment capital is starting to climb the ladder and speed of execution is there as well. I could do this all day, but I'm gonna get us into the content. So let's zoom all the way out and Lucy framed it perfectly, is the reason for the framework is to support decisions. Decisions are what matters and decisions that matter are, are our focus. Principally in this area of capability, institutions are facing a decision to buy, to build or to partner around a capability or to deliver some outcomes. On the right hand side, you can see a little bit of a framework around how we think about 
this decision set. Down the bottom is the, the capability around an institution's digital capability. I don't think it's a secret that higher education does not have strong digital capability. For the most part, for the last few hundred years, it's been focused on analog delivery and doing an incredible job. Some institutions have quite limited capability. There are other institutions we've just seen in the US, the iPads data come out, Western Governors University just blows me away every time I see those numbers, who are just incredibly advanced at digital capability. On the y-axis here, up and down, is, is if you like the institution's approach to risk. There are many institutions, I, I don't think again it'd be a secret to say for the most part higher education is risk averse. Um, however, there are institutions, um, there are um, contexts where institutions have um, are, are more accepting of risk and tolerating failure as well. And this is, this is about broad brush strokes. This is not about precision, this framework. But you can see here in the situations that are a little more um, accepting of building a capability, of buying a capability, partnering can happen across the whole spectrum um, as well. There are different circumstances. On the left-hand side, you can see some of the considerations that we see across these decision sets. So in, in buy, the process is, is generally procurement or, or an RFP takes a long time to get this approved by the council to define your actual requirements to issue as part of that. The costs are generally medium to large. You are buying or procuring a service or, or a capability. Of course, in the commercial world, buy refers to acquisitions and acquiring. In, in this context, we're talking about purchasing. We're talking about procurement. From a culture perspective, change management is a huge issue. You're going to have to change all of the processes institutionally, align everyone to this new system. Not everyone's going to be happy with change. Change management's a big issue. People and process is actually much more important than technology in this context for success. From an optionality perspective, it's not really the contractual piece that is locking you in. It's the fact that you are pivoting your entire institution onto a new set of processes and technologies, and that is sticky. It's like in uh, you know large corporations bringing in a new accounting system or enterprise resource planning system. It's not for the faint-hearted. This is a, a big decision. Um, from a contractual perspective, we talked about that. Building is when you've decided as an institution we're going to build this in-house. You know, I don't want to necessarily procure an array of services for this capability. We're, we're going to build this in-house. As you've all been a part of, this is a big project planning process, pitching to the council and to the board for budget. Execution will be slow. This is a long-term strategic decision. The costs are generally, um, I'm sure your experience is the same, whatever you think it is, times it by two or three, and then you'll be a little bit closer. From a talent perspective, this is, this is a magnificent opportunity. You're gonna grow talent. You're gonna acquire talent to build. Um, and that talent, if you're lucky, is going to stick around and help generate the outcomes that you were hoping for at the start. From an optionality perspective, we've all been there. It is really hard to abandon a build. It's something that the institution committed to years ago. You've been in those conversations. Um, although it happens, and most for the most part, it's when a leadership change happens, there's this sunk cost mentality we, we've spent this much money, we are going to finish this, we are not going to admit that this hasn't worked. Um, it's, it's sometimes really hard. On the partnership side, the processes are a little bit simpler than procurement, um, but I would, I would encourage, it's actually all about relationships when it's about partnerships. I mean, zoom out of the context we're talking and just think about the word partnership. Um, it's, about, it's about alignment. Generally, and it can be very fast execution, the partner, for the most part, already has all these capabilities and systems and processes set up and is you know, almost always incentivized to move very fast. They're generally also framed as a low upfront cost. Um, they're also framed, as we'll go into shortly, about risk sharing and about reward sharing as well. From a cultural perspective, back up to the relationships, this is going to be all about alignment between your values, between your incentives, between the outcomes you are both seeking. From a talent perspective, managing relationships, again, back up to the word partnerships is super important. As an institution, the neat thing about partnering is you've got this stepping stone optionality. Some institutions decide to partner because we don't have the capability today, 
let's work with someone who does and we'll hopefully we'll learn about that and we'll pick up some of those capabilities and we've got a bit of optionality um, post that contractual period. Contracts can be complex because it's a partnership. Uh, you really need to work that out, especially in risk reward sharing mechanisms as well. And then the other uh, issue to keep in mind is dealing with failure can be very difficult. Signing a 10 year partnership and failing magnificently in year two really, really hurts both sides as part of that. So that's a little bit about those considerations about, about buy, build and partner. Let's dig into buy for just a second to frame partner. Buy generally means you've decided to manage all of these discrete capabilities and services in house. On the demand and discovery, that might be an enrollment management firm, a recruitment firm. They're generally commission based because we're generally incentivizing um, that service on, on volume and on outcomes meeting quality thresholds, of course. On the learning design side, it's usually learning design firms, teams who are just expert at designing amazing digital learning um, assets and experiences. And this is generally consulting based time and materials as well. From a learner experience perspective, now we're starting to get into some of the tools and technologies and services that support the learner for an awesome learner experience. This could be LMS, SIS, video, student support help desk, tutoring, uh, you name it. It's a mix of subscription and per student costs generally. And then work and lifelong learning. I mean, it's great to see that earlier poll. I think this is the area that everyone is the most anxious about, seeing how important the labor market and employment outcomes are for students. Um, this could be portfolios, project-based internships, hiring platforms. Again, it's, it's subscription-based. Bear with me if this is uh, old news to you, but we've got uh, nearly a thousand folks uh, from all sorts. Some folks are uh, still not sure what the word OPM um, stands for, the acronym OPM stands for. Um, and we've got others who have been in this industry since day dot and, and created it, in fact. So, so please bear with us as we move through some of those concepts. So let's look at partnerships. What is an academic PPP? On the right, this great graphic from our friends at P3EDU kind of lays out the spectrum of partnerships in higher education. And you can see on the outer side is some of the partnerships you would have seen around parking, security, power and energy, the co-op, bookstore, food services, very infrastructure um, related. What we're talking about when we say academic PPP is partnerships that really touch the learner directly for their learning process as defined by Lucy and the framework from demand and discovery all the way through to work and, and lifelong learning. As, as we look through there. When we segment academic PPPs, and now we're starting to get into this detail, we think about a few different categories, which look very neatly organized here, but are actually incredibly and, and beautifully messy uh, as we see the evolution and the innovation happening in the industry. On the left-hand side are some of the large OPMs, they're online program managers that we've seen. They have broad capabilities across all of those domains. They reflect the color coding that Lucy shared. They've, they've really invested, that is their business, at being expert across the spectrum. Um, they've got long and strong portfolios of partnerships. So they've worked with many universities in many different contexts, geographic context, student context as well. You can see some of the names down there on the left hand side. There's a group of specialist OPMs who some of whom I will be getting an email after this saying we are a large OPM um, who are specialists perhaps or started specialists in an industry, in a geography. They might be specialists around certificate programs or a specific area. Um, this is a really exciting space and very fast growing space as well. Networks is super interesting. Networks is essentially partnerships that are bringing a whole bunch of universities together that sometimes is sharing courses. It sometimes is cross-loading students across their courses. Sometimes it's about credit recognition as well. And we've got some really fascinating ex examples here where the partnership is essentially forming a platform to connect universities together. MOOC is an OPM. Um, 
Coursera is all the rage. Uh, they filed for IPO on Friday and disclosed an enormous amount of information um, to the market. And we've seen uh, MOOCs over the years start to support degree programs. Uh, we really need to come up with another acronym for MOOC and OPM. We're working on it. OPX is our working title. Uh, MOOC does not describe um, the, the diversity and the breadth of the capabilities that these institutions or organisations are partnering with universities on. I think we'd be remiss to miss education as a benefit as a category. And whilst um, this is not perhaps by the book and OPX by definition, organisations like Guild and Instride work with employers to leverage the tuition reimbursement programs to provide their employees with access to online degree programs and increasingly non-degree and certificate programs as well. And so they're very strategically related to this component we saw just last week to you and Guild announce a partnership which is fascinating. Um, we've seen Noodle and Strategic Education announce a partnership in this area as well. There's a lot of activity. I suspect we'll see more as companies go back to work, um, touch wood post COVID. And then finally, really excitingly, I think the fastest growing and especially from that poll we saw at the start is, is boot camps. So traditionally they started as 12 to 24 week immersive programs to pivot my career. For example, I might have been a chef, I might have been uh, in the military, I might have been working in sales or in the stock market and I've decided I want to immerse myself in a 12 week program and pick up some skills that I know an employer is going to value. Um, the boot camp model has has exploded and evolved and um, is really incredible today. And partnering with universities now, as you'll see with some, some data very shortly, and it's kind of obvious when you look back um, at that trend there as well. Here's a quick graphic. I'm just gonna pause and give you the opportunity to have a look here at some of the brands that we see across this market. Like I said, I'm, I've no doubt I'll be getting in a lot of trouble after this for miscategorizing somebody or dare I say missing a logo, that would be really bad form. But these are some of the names that I'm sure you're familiar with um, that are really leading the charge, I think would be fair at public-private partnerships. Okay, moving right along, we're approaching our next poll again as well to get you involved and as uh, Lucy mentioned to make sure that um, you've been taking notes. Um, let's look at some of those models, OPMs, MOOCs and boot camps across the learner life cycle as well. Um, you can see here and you'll get the recording that each of these different models uh, bring different strengths and uh, different sets of capabilities to bear for each of these steps. Demand and discovery, you know, OPMs are expert at digital recruitment for high value, high stakes. MOOCs have amazing um, learner, learner profiles. I've captured an amazing number of us um, seeking to learn through those smaller snippets and, and may want to upskill. And boot camps have this very special way of working with universities, leveraging how broad a university's reach is within its um, geographic community as well as its global brand community. Learning design, I'd say all of these uh, models are really fantastic at designing because they've, they've been digitally native. They've been challenged by the digital environment from day one. That's, that's how they've, that they've worked. You know, OPMs have been delivering, you know, very complex, large, high stakes degree programs. So they've invested really heavily in learning design. MOOCs have been working from a platform perspective, starting out in that asynchronous, MOOC world and growing um, and brought you know different capabilities to bear. Boot camps started from day dot with project based learning. They started from day dot with industry practitioners building these programs because they knew what would, would be demanded. On the learner experience side, everyone is challenged with delivering in a digital environment and finding really novel and really clever ways of delivering outcomes in the on the digital spectrum. Boot camps started in analog, but moved very quickly online and COVID has really pushed the last few who weren't um, into that zone. And work on lifelong learning is an area that I see a lot of universities really motivated to partner 
with these um, organizations as well. Again, OPMs, whether it's been in healthcare for practicum, for licensure, for um, finding hiring partners to support their university partners as well. MOOCs have developed really large global cohorts of employers to are also upskilling their own staff through that process. And boot camps have always shouted from the rooftops the hallmarks of how successful they've been at placing their uh, graduates into into jobs and and uh, adding a multiple of their earning capacity post that boot camp kind of program as well. There's a bunch of commercial models here. Again, this is the grown up version of this conversation. Um, when you get to the heart of public private partnerships, you, we're talking about risk and reward sharing. Um, and it's a real grown up conversation. There's a very emotive, um, not a very intellectual, and that's me saying that conversation about rev share versus fee for service. Um, this is a really grown up conversation. Um, the rev share model, or there are other forms of royalty models, profit shares for joint ventures. Essentially, it's two organizations coming together, trying to share risk and reward and develop the right incentives for each other to make that partnership successful. On the fee for service side, there are a whole bunch of circumstances where an institution or a provider decides that that risk reward sharing mechanism is not appropriate or it's not fit for the circumstances. Um, and that changes, it's not it's no longer really a risk and reward sharing mechanism, it's a fee for a service. And the right hand side really just represents folks who are trying to bring the best of both of those models together into some kind of hybrid combination of, those, of that commercial kind of partnership. Okay, I've been talking for way too long, let's kind of stop there and let's get your view on what the top concerns are for higher education regarding public-private partnerships. So if you're at a university, what are the things that you are talking about when this conversation is happening? And if you're a, an OPM or if you're a boot camp or if you're a provider, what are the topics that you are challenged by when you are discussing um, the prospect of a partnership with a university around the world? We've got already control has really leapt out. Nearly half of respondents and I think we've allowed you to pick more than one for this poll we have um, so control is way up there ip slash competency ownership is way behind so control is inching to 50 percent it's actually 45 ip competency ownership is about 25 percent cost is right behind ip competency ownership and peer slash industry perception is at 10 percent right now so it's and remember we want to hear from everybody <laughs> yeah please jump in give us your two cents worth how are we running for time i think we're good all right control is dropping a little 42 percent ip competency ownership still 25 percent cost is actually really close to ip competency ownership peer slash industry perception is definitely there but it's only at 10%, so it, it exists, but it's half of IP competency ownership and cost and you know one, one quarter. Control is actually dropping a little as more folks jump in. Super interesting results. This is, this is great. All right, let's keep going. Size and growth. So we've talked a little bit about what some of this is help with some tools about how to think about it. Let's look at, at, at where it's at uh, right now. So let's zoom out again. It's kind of what we do at Hull and IQ. The global education market is $7.3 trillion. So basically about eight out of every $100 the world spends is on education. It is enormous and one of the single largest industries, if you, if you, if you call it that, around the world. Post-secondary education, that is higher education and the vocational system is about $2.3 trillion or will be $2.3 trillion by 2025. It's about $2.2 trillion. Now, the most significant aspect of this is we see tuition deflation over this period. So volume will go up as more and more enter the post-secondary system, but price will compress and come down over that period as well. We see the global online degree and micro-credential market at about 117 
billion dollars each year in 2025. Please don't read this slide as a commercial framing so much as an economic significance framing of how much parents, students, governments, companies spend um, on, on higher education. And then finally, the global OPM slash OPX market, we're strategic in how we frame that market. Um, we uh, upgraded our outlook last week based on the data to $13.3 billion of spend by 2025. That is the OPM revenue. That is not the total tuition of o programs that are powered by OPMs. When you look at a partnership level, which is uh, I think a more meaningful way to look at this, you can see this is the number of partnerships that have been formed with OPMs, boot camps, and international pathways each year since 2010. So the way to read this is in 2020, there were 303 new partnerships established with these partners around the world. In 2019, there was 223. We are now up to, don't quote me, I think about 700 unique universities around the world who have established these partnerships in the order of a thousand um, partnerships uh, in total. Of course, we track back pre 2010 as well. From a, you know, one of your questions will be, but what about public versus uh, private? And what about not for profit versus for profit? Well, you can see the cut here. It was actually public universities that led the charge to establish academic public private partnerships. And then last year, we saw a really significant gain in private not-for-profit universities also establishing those partnerships. They've all been establishing these partnerships over time, but it was really led by public universities um, over that period. When we break that down into OPMs versus boot camps, we're going to talk about MOOCs in detail two weeks from now and international education four weeks from now. So let's double click on OPMs and boot camps. On the left hand side, you can see the number of new partnerships. Again, this is annual new partnerships established for the US market, which really led the build of this model and the growth of this model. And then the international market, you can see on the left hand side just how quickly the international OPM market is growing. And on the right hand side, you can see boot camp partnerships. So this is not just a boot camp establishing itself. This is a partnership between a boot camp and a university and just how significant the last couple of years have been in the growth of this model around the world. It's really been enormous. When we look at that by university type again, you see a, a similar trend here. So on the left hand side, you can see the public universities really leading the charge and uh, you see the private not-for-profit universities growing in the last year quite significantly. On the right hand side, you can see that trend for uh, the university bootcamp partnerships. Does size matter? We can see here across our sizing bands, and uh, my apologies for not having the enrollment numbers, but very large is 50,000 annual enrollments uh, plus, very small I think is 1,000. Um, you can see here size doesn't matter so much. Uh, the very small universities uh, are not partnering uh, really as significantly. Um, you can see here there are some variations and of course the sample that we're looking at has variation as well. But uh, on the right hand side though, the only trend that really jumps out at me there is very large institutions are really leading the partnerships with boot camps around the world. So before we jump to our last poll and start to wrap up, um, if you joined us two weeks ago, four weeks ago, it's all a blur. Uh, we sized the global micro and alternative credential market and really started to segment that and, and pull that apart. Um, this is significant because OPMs and boot camps are big players and, and uh, also explicitly called out here about how large this market is. In the boot camp market there, you can see we sized this for 2019, so this is pre-COVID. We are nervous about sizing 2020, given how weird a year it was, um, at $900 million um, spent on bootcamp programs. That's both direct-to-consumer, business-to-business, and university partnership programs. 
non-degree certificates, post-secondary micro-credentials. We're seeing a lot of OPMs and what we call OPX, which is the category we use to bring all of these players together into the one strategic umbrella. Um, this is a thriving market. We're seeing uh, a lot of growth. Professional certifications, which we feel are left out too often in this strategic conversation and will actually be a big part of the future. They are our professional certifications around accounting, around finance, around technology, legal, nursing, healthcare, project management, uh, and increasingly technology. And then finally, that enormous, dynamic, fast growing world of online courses and badges uh, from all sorts of folks focused on the learner, focused on organizations around the world. So this is a really significant part of the growth of the OPM and bootcamp market as well. All right, let's pause here before we move to looking at the future. We are um, fast running out of time. I wanna just take the temperature and acknowledging we've got folks from all across the world, all across the sector, just based off that information, just as you're sitting here today, how has your perception of public-private partnerships changed? Has it not really changed? It's just reinforced your view. Is it moderately more attractive in your view now, significantly more attractive or in the opposite direction? Actually, it's moderately less attractive or significantly less attractive. So we've got a little bit, no surprise, we've got some real experts on this webinar, about 50% no substantial change. We've got about 30% moderately more attractive and 20% significantly more attractive. Fascinatingly, nobody thinks it's significantly less attractive. 2% moderately less attractive, which is interesting. Please jump in. It's only gonna cost you a click. This is definitely one of those ones where I'd like to see more context in the chat. For sure. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna let it settle here. So we've got 45% no substantial change, 44%. 35% moderately more attractive, 20% significantly more attractive, and 2% moderately less attractive. Nobody thinks it's significantly less attractive. Fascinating, fascinating outcomes. All right, we are short on time. So let's finish by looking out to the future at some scenarios. We developed these scenarios, I think nearly two years ago, when we started to really double down and deep dive on the OPX market as we framed it. We looked across two dimensions at where the OPX market might be in 2030. The first dimension left to right as you see it is the university decision to either outsource or to insource. And I know they are dirty words for some, but um, essentially defining that decision to build internally or to outsource and partner. That kind of vertical decision set looks across the industry on the supply side of these partnerships as to whether they would consolidate and form fewer larger players or whether we would see this market fragment and unbundle into many discrete, less connected services. And so, I'm gonna poll you on where you think the OPX market will be in 2030 very, very shortly. I'll open that poll now. Please don't jump in until, actually I'm gonna hold that, until we've described this, right? So top left, let me just paint the world. Top left, we've seen this market succeed and we've seen it consolidate. That big landscape of logos you saw decreases in the number of players because this has been very successful and we've seen the consolidation. Universities, for the most part, decided, you know what, with these incredible partners out there, we should give that load to them and we should focus on the things that are important to us in order to do. Um, and that is how um, the world plays out in 2030. Bottom left is where we see the market fragment, where there is a preference for universities to procure discrete services as they would like them. We're less likely to see big uh, revenue share risk reward sharing mechanisms are more likely to see universities managing internally a, an array of discrete services for which are assembled um, internally. They're still outsourcing, but they're outsourcing discrete 
less connected services. On the right hand side, top right is university network. This is a scenario where universities say, you know what, I think we could do this ourselves if we just work together. Um, and universities essentially, perhaps empowered by some platforms as well, share more courseware, share more expertise, share more capability. This is a world where we're seeing much more collaboration in higher education on the teaching side, not just the research side. Bottom right, we call university DIY or do it yourself. And this is a scenario where universities say, there's no way we're sharing, we are all competitors. We are gonna do this ourselves and there's no way we're partnering either. We are going to build a lot of this capability internally ourselves. I'm sure we'll procure a little bit, but we're gonna do that. I, I acknowledge that these are extreme scenarios, but that's the beauty of scenarios is it makes, it forces you to pick one of these um, extreme end states. So the poll is open now. This is our last item for the webinar. So if there was ever a time to click your preference, it's now. We're seeing, ooh, okay, OPX unbundling is taking a bit of a lead. OPX oligopoly isn't far behind. University network is further behind. University DIY, there are a couple of aspirational proponents, but it's 2%. Please jump in. This is our last poll for this session. Thank you so much for hanging in there. We've got a few hundred folks here, so please jump in. Okay, as it settles there, and just before I hand over to Beth, OPX unbundling, nearly 50%. It's somewhere between 45 and 50%. OPX oligopoly, 32%, so about a third. University network is about 18%, 20%. And university DIY has crept up now to 3%. So unbundling, OPX unbundling, OPX oligopoly, university network, university DIY. Beth, I'm sorry for talking so much, that's heaps, over to you. <laughs> that was amazing. Really, yep, okay, we did that. <laughs> really impressed with how many polls and insights we got through, so great job, everyone. Great, okay, we're gonna let you all go now, but just very quickly before you send we send you off, a couple of key takeaways. Definitely, definitely, if you do one thing only after this session, please make sure that it's joining our global network. This is where you can join lots of like-minded folks. If you enjoyed the conversation today in the chat, in the polls with us, this is just an even better way to stay part of it. So definitely please do that. We'll follow up with information about how to do so, but by joining the network, you get lots of amazing updates as we continue this work, invitations to more events, opportunities to participate in the research and do the uh, digital capability self-assessment, which is a huge, huge value driver. Um, so definitely excited to see you all there. The next session is in a couple of weeks. Time is confusing these days, so that'll be like tomorrow. Um, we're gonna be looking just at MOOCs and it's gonna be a really rich conversation. So hope to see you there. And thanks everyone again for joining us. Massive thank you to Pat and Lucy and to Maria for manning all the things in the background and excited to see you all next time. Thanks everybody. Thanks, see you.